Okay, our second speaker is Xavier Rosoton from ICREA and the University of Barcelona. Please. Thank you very much. Okay, well, so uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this uh, nice conference. So it's my pleasure to talk about uh, the Stefan problem here in the Centennial Conference of Olga Ladizenskaya. And so I will talk about a recent work, which is a interpreting on archive, a joint work with Alessio Figali and Joachim Serra. And it concerns the singular set in the Stefan problem. Okay, so let me start by explaining what is the Stefan problem and what are the known results in this direction, and then we'll go to the to our recent results. Okay, so the Stefan problem is is essentially the I would say the most classical free boundary problem, and it describes the melting of ice. Okay, so we have uh, in this context we, we would have a picture like this. Okay, so we have say uh, a certain big domain. And then inside we have liquid water that has some ice and the ice is melting. Okay, so I will assume that uh, the ice is at zero degrees. Uh, this is for simplicity. This is like the simplest case of the Stefan problem. This is what called the one phase Stefan problem. So the ice is at zero degrees, water is at positive temperature. And then we need to, we want to know to understand this system, how this system evolves. Okay, so how does the ice melts uh, in this in this case. Okay, so this is what is called the free boundary. Okay, it's a moving boundary. And here we will have maybe some boundary conditions on the fixed boundary. So the PD that this system satisfies is, uh, well, of course, in the in the liquid water part, we have that uh, the temperature solves the heat equation. Okay, so in here, if theta denotes the temperature at every point, we have simply that uh, the heat equation is satisfied in the set where theta is positive. Okay, so notice this is a linear equation, but in an unknown domain, because this domain, we don't know how it's moving. Okay, and then the, the description, I mean, to have a, a complete description of the system, we need the, the free boundary condition here, which is called the Stefan condition. Okay, and, and this is how the free boundary is determined. So this is saying that at every instant of time, the speed at which the free boundary melts, so the speed at which the ice is melting, is proportional to the gradient in space, okay, of the temperature. So the more uh, the more temperature I have nearby, the faster this will melt. Okay, so and this is the the physical, I mean, this is the physical condition that comes from the from melting of ice, and this is what is called the Stefan condition. Okay, so these two. Uh, equations are, are sufficient to determine a unique solution. And, and then in order to study this problem, what, uh, what one can do is to do a so-called Dubois transform. Okay, so this is a transformation that instead of studying directly the temperature theta, we study the following quantity. So we study the integral in time of the temperature. And then we do this locally. Okay, so locally near a free boundary point, which is not in the initial condition, we do this, and then the integral of the temperature will satisfy with that, well, u is not negative, okay, u is monotone in time, and moreover, it will satisfy this equation, okay? So as I said, this is not, you cannot take this as a global condition, but for example, you could uh, center around this point, you look at it locally, then in a neighborhood, you will satisfy this. Okay, and then this is uh, this is the equation we use because this is actually the parabolic version of the obstacle problem, for which we have very nice properties and monotonicity formulas, and then we can understand the problem better in this way. Okay, so just to emphasize uh, the difference between this and this, so the only thing that we cannot treat with this formulation are the possible singularities of the free boundary that appear as an initial condition. But if you put uh, an initial condition that is smooth, for example, then uh, it immediately starts melting. And then for any free boundary point for positive time, you can understand if uh, the free boundary is regular or singular by simply look, studying this equation. 
Okay, so this is the question that that we will study, and and this is also sometimes called the the Stefan problem. Okay, so the Stefan problem uh, is also this this equation is also referred to as the Stefan problem. Okay, so as I said, this is the parabolic version of the obstacle problem as well, and and then let's let's look at it uh, in a bit more detail. So we have this equation that is we have a negative function such that it solves this uh, heat operator equal to minus a characteristic function. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, notice that because the right hand side is bounded, then the solution is automatically C1. Okay, this function U is C1. And therefore, this implies the following. This implies that I have a non-negative function such that whenever the function is positive, it solves the heat equation with right hand side minus one. And on the free boundary, not only U is zero, okay, by definition, u is zero on the free boundary, but in addition, uh, the gradient must be zero as well. Okay, so it's like we have uh, a free boundary with a heat equation here, and then here on the free boundary, we have both Dirichlet and Neumann conditions. So you can look at it as an overdetermined problem. Okay, and this is the same. So this is the same problem, and this has a unique solution uh, as well. Okay, and then we have uh, in this free type of free boundary problem, we also have, uh, we always have two unknowns, which is the solution and the contact set. Okay, so of course, once you know the solution, then you know the contact set because it's just the set where u is zero. And the same, if you know the contact set, then you know the solution because you can solve the PDE on a fixed domain. The problem is that they are connected and they one depend on each other. So you have the two unknowns at the same time. Okay, so. Um, let me explain as well uh, a completely different motivation for studying this problem that comes from probability. Okay, and it's when you study the optimal stopping, stopping problem, uh, and it's the following. So say that we have a Brownian motion in in a ren in full space. Okay, and we are giving a smooth payoff function. Okay, say so say that pi is C infinity function even with compact support, uh, and then. We have this Brownian motion, and then we can decide to stop the, pro the process, this stochastic process. We can decide to stop it at any time. Okay, so for any tau, I can decide whether to stop or not to stop the, the process. And then I get a payoff, which is the, the phi, the function phi, at the point where the, the, the process is. So I get phi of x t, x tau. Okay, and then so this is a game, and uh, and the, the, I mean, the, the goal of the game is to maximize the expected payoff. Okay, so the, the question is, what is the best strategy? What is the optimal strategy if I want to maximize the expected payoff? Okay, and then the question uh, essentially is the following. So if I know that I'm at point X in space and at time T, okay, should I stop or should I wait? Should I stop the process or should I continue the process? That's the, the question I want to to answer in order to, to, to answer this, this question, to maximize the expected payoff, this is the question I should, I should answer. And so uh, this creates two separate regions in, in space time, which is the, the region in which I should stop, which is the exercise region uh, in finance, or the, the region when I should not stop, okay? And then you just wait for, for better payoffs in the future. And then, so how do we find these regions? How do we solve this optimal stopping problem? Well, you define the value function, which is the maximum expected payoff among all possible stopping times, okay? And then if you define this, then it turns out that this function uh, solves the PDE. And if you write the PDE for V minus phi, okay, where phi is this uh, payoff, then I call this U. U solves a Stefan problem in a range. Okay, maybe with a right hand side, which is different than minus one, but it's just still uh, the same problem. So U solves the Stefan problem in a REN is the exact same problem that I saw before uh, for the melting of ice. Okay. And, and as I said, this is the exercise region uh, is the region where the expected payoff equals phi. So this is the ice region. Okay, so ex exercise region corresponds to ice. Uh, and these models are used in mathematical finance, and a typical example is the pricing of American functions. Okay, so we have a completely different uh, 
motivation as well. If you want to think about, uh, you know, like physics and you prefer probability, well, then that's another way to, to think about this problem. Okay, so now from the mathematical point of view, the fundamental question we have here is, well, what can we say about the free boundary? Okay, so what can we say about the regularity of the free boundary, about the geometry of the free boundary? And so the, the question is, is the free boundary smooth? Okay, and because when you imagine ice melting, I mean, you, you can already see that maybe it can create some cusps sometime, but often you expect it to be smooth, but then you have to prove this mathematically. Right. So the first results in the 60s and 70s uh, established that solutions U are C11 in space. Okay. And this is optimal because the Laplacian, remember, it's discontinuous because the Laplacian is minus one in some region and is, then the function is just zero in a whole other region. So the Laplacian is discontinuous and U is C11. This is optimal. And uh, the solution is C1 in time. And this turns out to be optimal as well. Okay, so this is the best you can prove for solutions, but this still does not tell you anything about the free boundary because the the contact set, I mean, the ice region is just the set where u is zero, and u is a nice function, but the zero set of a nice function still uh, could be anything. So because we are looking at the boundary of a set, which is the zero set of a C11 function, well, this is this could be really bad. Okay, and then the first results uh, in this direction, the first results in the direction of the regularity of the free boundary were established by Kinderler and Nuremberg in 1977. And it said that if the free boundary is C1, okay, and that's a big if, if the free boundary is C1, then it is actually C infinity in space and time. Okay, so, oops, uh, so that this is a, this is a typical result uh, that you can think also when you have like Hilbert 19th problem, when you have a uh, minimal surfaces. So there are many questions in, in elliptic PDs, right, or parabolic that uh, have a similar phenomenon that you have a nonlinear equation, but then if you assume some initial regularity, then you can use perturbative arguments in order to improve the regularity and get a bootstrap argument that gives you symphony, right? So for example, if a minimal surface is C1, then you can use just shouter estimates to get that it's actually infinity. Okay, then here it's the same, but the theorem was much more complicated. So, but the idea is that this is a perturbative argument that shows that if you have some initial regularity that the free boundary is C1, then you can uh, bootstrap and get up to infinity. Okay, so, and then the, the, the other, I mean, the last question that, uh, I mean, the most important question that remained open uh, is that, well, is it true that the free boundary is C1 or not? Okay, and this is the, really the nonlinear question. This is the, the question that is more delicate usually in this kind of free boundary problems. And this was a breakthrough due to Caffarelli. So in the same year, Caffarelli in his famous, famous paper in ACTA, uh, he proved that the free boundary is actually C1 and therefore C infinity, possibly outside a certain set of singular points. Okay, so the exact result of Caffarelli says that either the ice has zero density at the point. Okay, so this would be a singular point because this would be the ice, uh, this would be liquid water here. And then it says that uh, there is a dichotomy. Either the ice has zero density, so kind of a cast is being created. So either the ice has zero density or everything else is infinity everywhere. Okay, so that's the, that's the theorem of Caffarelli. And it's uh, the dichotomy between singular and regular points. Okay, so let's look at the proof of this result uh, for, for a few minutes so that uh, we understand how it works and then we can see what's the, what, what can we possibly prove about singular points. Okay, so uh, to start with the regularity of the free boundary, we consider blow ups. Okay, so this is uh, the strategy that comes from minimal surfaces from the, the classical theory of minimal hypersurfaces in, in RN and goes as follows. So you, you want to rescale your solution. You want to zoom in your free boundary, okay? And then take the limit, you zoom in, you rescale, and you want to take the limit as R goes to zero, okay? So you zoom in to an infinite uh, infinitesimal scale, okay? And for, to do this in this, uh, in this context, you define these functions UR, which is rescale with the parabolic scaling and divide by R square 
it, because this is the natural scaling parameter of the equation. And then you have to prove that you have to prove that this uh, converges to something, okay, to a, an, to a function u0, which is a global solution to the same equation, and moreover, is not trivial, okay, it's not zero. And then this is fairly standard, okay, so you can prove that by C11 estimates, this will converge in C11, uh, in C1 alpha norm to a function, and this function will be non trivial, and this function will solve the same equation in the full space. Okay, and now the question is to classify blow ups. Okay, so this is really the key question and the key difficulty here. You want to now say, well, these functions, so these are called the blow up at the point. So this function can only be these or this. I mean, you want to really give a complete classification of blow ups that allows you to understand a dichotomy between free boundary points. And this is what Caffarelli did and showed that there are only two options. So either we have a 1D solution. Okay, the, which would be this case. Okay, so this is like a half space solution, a half space of, you see in the limit, a half space of ice and a half space of liquid water that looks like this, like a quadratic polynomial. And this is what you expect at regular points. Okay, and then the alternative, either this happens or the only alternative is that you get this kind of paraboloids, quadratic polynomials that are, that are homogeneous of degree two, and then they look like this. So this is what you expect when you have a cusp because uh, the ice in this case be becomes only a line. Okay, so if you have a cast and you zoom in and, and do a blow up, you expect to see just like a line or a point. And this is what happens with these polynomials. So this is what you expect at singular points. Okay, and, and this is the theorem. This is the classification of blow ups that only these two things can happen. Okay, and then it's uh, quite easy to show that if you get have this as a blow up, then the contact set has zero density. Okay, so the ice has zero density at that point. And then the question is, well, I still need to prove that if I get this as a blow up, then the free boundary is C1 in a neighborhood. Okay, and then this is the, the second part, which you need to transfer the information from the original solution, uh, so, sorry, from the blow up U0 to the original solution U. Okay, and then prove that the free boundary is C1 in a neighborhood of a regular point. So just from the information at one point. So at one point, you get this as a blow up. Then you want to prove that this is the what happens in a neighborhood. And it is actually what Caffarelli did and prove that in a neighborhood, you have that all points are regular and the free boundary is C1 and therefore C infinity uh, near this point. Okay, so that's all for the classical theory and the dichotomy between regular and singular points. And then well, then the natural question comes after, and it's, well, what can we say about singular points? Okay, so let's say we have a picture like this. Okay, in this case, I have only one singular point. Everything else is regular points. This is very nice, so there's not much to say here. But is this the worst that can happen, or we could have uh, worse? We could have larger sets of singular points, maybe. Okay, and actually, it turns out that you can have much worse. So, for example, here, instead of one cusp, you could have infinitely many casts, one, at, one next to each other, or singular points that form a line, or things like this. Okay, so a, in, a priori, uh, there, there are examples uh, that were actually constructed also in the 70s by Sheffer that says that the, the set of singular points can be, for example, in 2D, it could be any subset of a line, essentially. Okay. So this is uh, what uh, happens with the examples we have, okay? And then what uh, Caffarelli proved in 98, and then Monod, so Caffarelli did it in the elliptic, in the stationary case, elliptic case, and then Monod and Blanchet, uh, so Blanchet did it in the parabolic case, which is the one corresponding to the Stefan problem. And the result says that in space, so if you look at the singular set only in space, then singular points are contained in an n minus one dimensional C1 manifold. Okay, so this is optimal in terms of the dimension, n minus one. So this is a really nice result because it matches with the examples I was saying about Sheffer. Okay, so Sheffer, for example, showed that in 2D, you could have uh, a singular set that is any closed set contained in a line. So the theorem of Caffarelli Monod Manchet says that this is the worst that can happen. That if you look at it in space, 
uh, singular points are contained in an n minus one dimensional C1 manifold. Okay, so this is great. Um, and when I say in space, I'm not being very precise, but uh, I will be in a second, I will be more precise in a second. But you can think that for every fixed time, for example, for every fixed time, this happens. Okay, and this is really what uh, follows from the result. And moreover, if the origin, say, is a singular point, okay, so for, for any singular point, if P2 is the blow up, so it's the quadratic polynomial that gives you the blow up at that point, you really have an expansion like this, that the solution U of xt equals to this quadratic polynomial plus a small error. Okay, and this is really the, the, the I mean, the proof of this, uh, of this result actually goes like this. So you prove first this, you prove that the blow up is unique and you have an expansion like this for your solution U, that U is the blow up plus a small error, okay? And then this implies that the singular set is contained in a C1 manifold, okay, in space. Why do I say in space? Well, because this error is, has the parabolic scaling, so it's much uh, better in space than in time. And this is why you get this result in space, essentially, okay? And then uh, in the stationary setting, so if you look at the obstacle problem, which is the, st the stationary version of the problem we are studying, then there, there have been several improvement of beauty result, and they have been obtained by Bice in 99, by Colombos, Polar, Balichkov in 2017, by Figali Serra in 2017, and also in a joint paper, uh, another joint paper that I think uh, Figali, let's say Figali will talk about in this conference, which is a uh, joint work with Figali, myself, and Sam also. Okay, but all this was for the stationary case. And then uh, essentially all these results what they tried to do was to improve this error. So to, to say, well, what is the best I can put here? And then Vice put here in the, in the stationary case, so there is no T here at two plus alpha for some alpha into D only. Uh, then Columbus color Berichkov, they put a logarithmic model of continuity only extra, uh, but in all dimensions. And then Figali Serra proved that this logarithmic is optimal. And moreover that you can put a three in all dimensions, except for a small set in which you can only put the log. Okay, but all these results concerned with, with uh, improving this expansion uh, in an optimal way. So to prove the optimal rate of convergence to blow ups. Okay. And in the parabolic case though, we have one question that, uh, that is very important is what can we say about the size of the singular set? Okay, so because in the stationary case, we know it's a n minus one dimensional uh, C1 manifold. So that's the best you could say in terms of size. But here it's not clear because I'm just saying that in, uh, for every fixed time, so in space, I am like n minus one dimensional. But what about uh, in space time, right? So as a subset, uh, the singular set as a subset of space time, it is not clear what is the best uh, parabolic house of dimension. Okay, so the previous result uh, that I said implies that for every time the singular set is contained in a C1 manifold, but the problem is that such manifold is only C1 half in time. Okay, so because of this scaling, you get uh, a C1 half regularity in time. Okay, and then C1 half regularity in time does not behave well with that with house those dimensions. So uh, this does not even yield that the singular set is n minus one dimensional in space time. We don't even have the right dimension of the singular set, okay? And this is the question that we wanted to tackle. So this is the question that had been open for, for, for many years actually, and is, the, is that is the singular set n minus one dimensional in space time or not, okay? And the most natural way to measure this is in the parabolic distance, which uh, has this parabolic scale, okay? So this is the first result that we prove in our paper. So this is, a, as I said, a preprint 2021. Uh, and then we establish the following. So if we have any solution to the Stefan problem, which is non-stationary, okay? And then sigma denotes the set of singular points, then the, the parabolic house dimension of the singular set is at most n minus one, okay? And this is of course optimal because even for one time slice, this could happen, okay? So what I'm saying here is 
even though for one fixed time, the singular set could be n minus one dimensional, when I look at it as a subset of space time, so adding the time variable, then it still has the same dimension. It still has dimension n minus one. Okay, so this is really nice because in the stationary case, the regular part of the free boundary is n minus one dimensional, while the singular part could be n minus one dimensional of the same dimension. Well, in the parabolic, this cannot happen. In the parabolic, as a subset of Rn plus one, the regular set has dimension n plus one because the time axis has dimension two uh, in the parabolic scaling. So, and the singular set has dimension n minus one. Okay, so it's smaller. So the singular set has a smaller dimension. And, and this is nice. This is the first time that this was proved with the optimal dimension bound. And, and to prove this, we need really a finer understanding of singular points that we also established in the same paper. Okay. And so one thing to notice here is that this implies, this result implies that when we are in 2D, then the free boundary is infinity for almost every time. Okay, so why is this? Well, this says that in 2D, the singular set has dimension at parabolic dimension at most one. Okay, but the, the time axis in the parabolic, uh, with the parabolic distance, has dimension two. So, because the time axis has dimension two, and then I'm proving that this set has dimension at most one, uh, then this implies that the singular set. Uh, is empty for almost every time. So that the free boundary is completely infinity, like with no singular points at all for almost every time. Okay. In 2D, if I make a random, take a random time, I don't see any cusps or any singular points at all. Okay. And this is the first time where, where we get this, uh, this result. Okay. Now, this raises uh, a very natural question, which is well, can we say the same in, in the physical dimension in 3D, right? So is the same result, this, this regularity for almost every time, is it true also in 3D, which is the physical dimension? That would be really nice. Uh, unfortunately, it does not follow from this. Okay, so it does not follow from these results. So if we want to prove something like that in higher dimensions, we need to improve our understanding of the singular set even more, okay? So this is the, the second question that we want to tackle in, in our paper and that we also, we also answer. Okay, so if you look at the Stefan problem in three dimensions in the physical space, then we prove the following. So if you have any solution to the Stefan problem in, in 3D, which is non-stationary, then for almost every time, the free boundary is symphony with no singular points. Okay. And moreover, we can get a, a dimension bound for the for the set of singular times. Okay, so if you decide, define the set of singular times, okay, so a singular time is just any time for which there is at least one singular point. Okay, and then you look at this set of singular times, then the as a subset of R, the Hausdorff dimension of this set of singular times is at most one half. Okay. Um, and, and this, turns out to be, this turns out to be much more difficult than the previous results. So we need way more uh, finer understanding of the singular set to prove this. And, and this is the content of, of like more than half of the paper. So I would say like a third of the paper is devoted to prove the first result. And then uh, two thirds is to, to improve our understanding of the singular set and in particular get this result. Okay. so. And a, a very natural question here is, well, is this one half sharp? Well, the answer is we have no idea. We don't know, okay? But it's definitely critical, okay? In the sense that with the methods that we use, it seems really, really critical in the sense that it's really impossible to, to improve this exponent one half, okay? So we would need, one would need completely different methods in order to, to improve this one half. So even though it's completely different from, from I mean, it's a completely different equation, but something similar happens with navier stokes right? So you know that the set of singular times, it's also has, it also has dimension one half, and this one half is critical, and no one knows if this is sharp or not. I mean, actually, navier stokes you don't know if, even if there are singularities or not. Here, we know that they, I mean, they do exist, so there are singularities, 
and we can you can for example construct examples of singularities with infinitely many times uh, for which there are singularities but uh, we don't have any example in which this one half is really attained on in any way okay so we don't know if this is optimal or not but it's definitely critical and uh, okay so this result so actually the two previous results end up uh, following from a more general result which is the, the, uh, our main theorem in the paper and it's a theorem in Arendt which implies the previous two results so it reads as follows so if we have any solution to the Stefan problem which is non-stationary and you denote sigma set of singular points then we split sigma into two pieces okay so the singular set can be split into two pieces one large part sigma okay uh, because then it turns out the dimension of the points that are not in sigma star so sigma minus sigma star has dimension at most n minus two okay so sigma is most of the singular set and then this other part is small because it has co-dimension one and then in sigma star we prove that this set sigma star is contained in a countable union of infinity manifolds of dimension n minus one so this is even better than all previous results for the stationary case okay so this is really nice because you get a symphony expansion for for solutions uh, at these singular points and this symphony manifold actually symphony flat and this is why you don't see it for many times so it's not a symphony manifold that can cross times and be tangential so it's really a symphony manifold that at every point of this manifold is symphony flat uh, so for every singular set, you have this. So you have uh, a, a large part of singular points, which is infinity and of dimension n minus one, and then you have the other part, which is smaller. It has simply dimension parabolic dimension n minus two. Okay, and then of course this implies the previous result uh, because of the first one because this has dimension n minus one and this is bounded by n minus one. So of course, and then this also implies the result in three D because when you project this sigma star into the time axis, it has dimension zero. So it's like when, when looking at the time axis, sigma star doesn't matter at all. And what matters is only this small part, which in 3D, you get the dimension one half in time, okay? So, and to prove this, we need a much finer understanding of singular points that, uh, that we established in our paper. And, and as I said, this implies the previous result in, in 3D. Okay, so this is the general theorem we want to prove uh, in this paper. So let me discuss this for, uh, for a little bit. So basically the, what we need in order to prove that the singular set, so the same way that to prove that the singular set was C1, we needed to prove that the blow up is unique, right? So that to prove that the singular set is C1, you needed an expansion which is saying that u is the blow up plus a small error, right? And this is what implied that the, that, the, that the singular set was contained in a C1 manifold. If you want to improve this C1, what you need to do is to improve this uh, expansion, okay? So essentially, if we want a infinity expansion, we need to improve, uh, if you want, sorry, a infinity manifold, we need a infinity expansion, okay? And this is what we do. So if we have any solution to the Stefan problem, and sigma is the set which is non-stationary and sigma is the set of singular points then this is the result okay so let's uh let's read it uh so there exists this set sigma star okay so remember the the complement of sigma star inside the singular set is small okay so let's forget about the these other this small part so in sigma star we have the following we have that the solution up to a very small error as because this is for any k okay so to an error that can be as small as I want. So this is infinity small. We have this expansion for you. U looks like this. So this is a positive part. This is a negative part. So these are like two fronts. Okay. So this is this function, this, this function with positive part, this other function with negative part. So these are uh, x dot e. This would correspond to the polynomial uh, because it's here and here. So for example, when there are no terms like this, okay, so if these terms are not here and these terms are not here, then positive part and negative part, they just match. 
uh, and then you just get one half of x dot e squared. Okay, this is the blow up actually at most points. It looks like this. Okay, so when k is uh, two, this is really you recover. You put k equals two, then these terms are not here, and then you recover the the expansion that I mentioned at the beginning. Now this expansion is now true for every k. Okay, and then it turns out that you have to add these terms. So you have to add a, a certain v plus times t and a polynomial, a higher order polynomial, and here with a minus, a v minus times t, and a higher order polynomial as well. Okay, so these are positive numbers, v plus and v minus, strictly positive, and and these are q plus q minus are certain polynomials satisfying compatibility conditions. Okay, let's forget about uh, them. So. If you think about how this looks like, well, this v plus and v minus, so these are like two fronts. Okay, so the free boundary for this is a is a front, is a, like a surface, n minus one dimensional surface, and this is another n minus one dimensional surface that they collapse into each other at time zero. Okay, so this is giving us kind of geometric information about how the blow up, how the singular set, how the singular point happens in this set sigma star. Okay, so these are like two fronts with positive velocities that collapse one to each other. Okay, and then the terms q plus and q minus actually correspond to curvature, curvature terms. Okay, so so this gives a much more deeper geometric understanding of most singularities. Okay, so this is saying at most singularities, not all of them, but at most singularities, uh, we have these velocities of two fronts that are collapsing at time t equals zero. So you have two fronts that are like this, and they create a singular point at time zero. And and these two fronts have some curvature, and these these polynomials q plus and minus correspond to these curvature terms. Okay, so this is what uh, what is happening, and and then the dimension n minus two of the of the other set is sharp because not all singularities are like this. So some singularities are like this. You create two fronts and they collapse to each other, but you can have other types of singularities. Okay, so you, for example, you could have a tube in 3D that is uh, melting, a tube of ice that is melting, and you create a, a different kind of singular point. And this, they could have dimension n minus two. Okay, so this is sharp in the sense that at, at the, the n minus one dimensional set, we get exactly what is happening. Okay, with a very precise and simplicity understanding of this set. And the rest of singular points, we don't know what happens, but we get the sharp dimension for them, which is n minus two. Okay, so we have split the singular set into two pieces and, and both results, results are sharp. One for the regularity, the other for the dimension. Okay, and then to prove the results, so this is really uh, delicate and lengthy and, and and we need really a variety of new ideas. And then we combine uh, tools from geometric measure theory, like dimension reduction uh, arguments. Uh, then we need also fine PD estimates. And then we also need new monotonicity formulas. So it's really a combination of, of many, many things. And so essentially, just to simplify and get an overview of how, to, how do we prove it. So initially, you want to start with the, the expansion you already have say that u is the polynomial plus a small error. And then you want to subtract, take u minus the polynomial and do another blow up. And then try to see that you get a better expansion. Okay, so that you get something that is homogeneous of higher degree, say of degree two plus alpha or three. Okay, so you want to improve the expansion step by step from the expansion that we had, which was of order two, okay, to an expansion of order three. And this is done with dimension reduction arguments. Okay, so this is done by doing like this second blow up uh, that is uh, u minus the blow up, you rescale and you do a dimension reduction argument and so on. And this is an idea that comes from the stationary setting, from the elliptic, from the obstacle problem, from the work of, of Figali, Serra, and also our joint work, Figali, myself, and Serra. Uh, so we use the same kind of ideas, but they are more delicate in the parabolic case. Okay, but this is the first step. So this is the initial step. Uh, and then we get up to order three. So if you try to do this, you try to repeat what works for the stationary case, you at order three, you get completely stuck. 
Okay, and then you need completely new ideas that are unrelated to the stationary case to go from order three to order three plus epsilon. Okay, to, this is the most difficult step in the proof to pass from the expansion of order three to the expansion of order three plus epsilon. Yeah? Okay, this is funny because you want to go from two to infinity, but the really delicate point turns out to be from three to three plus epsilon. Okay, and and this is this is the part that requires uh, really really new uh, ideas and tools. Okay, so we, we end up doing a dimension reduction argument, but but with no algorithm frequency formula, with no monotonicity formula, really, that can help us there. Okay, and then once you are at 3 plus epsilon, it's like you have one because the because you are proving that you had that like two fronts. So these two fronts, once you have the expansion of order 3 plus epsilon, they behave as if, so it's not completely true, but they behave as if they were two completely separate solutions on one side and on the other. Okay, and then we get infinity regularity in one final step, which is completely independent. Okay, so uh, this is the, the final step. And then just to finish, uh, so this was the, the proof of the result. So just to finish, uh, a consequence of the, of the result is the following, which is that in 2D, if you have any solution to the Stefan problem in 2D, uh, the set of singular times has Hausdorff dimension zero. Okay, so in 2D, we can get much better than the one half, which is the one in 3D, and we get zero. Okay, and then this is the, the best you can, you can prove. So even remember that even the regularity for almost every time, so even saying that the set of singular times has major zero was new, then we are proving that it has dimension zero, which is way stronger. Okay, and for this, the expansion up to order infinity is essential. And, and I will finish this. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Questions, comments? I have a question. Oh, yes. Yes, me? Yes, yes, please. Just... Yes, oh, well, Sophia, amazing. Your results are really, really amazing. Thank you. And uh, I'm surprised with this new information which in a certain sense is remarkable. But I'm wondering, uh, okay, this is uh, one phase different problem. So there is a monotonicity in time, increasing in time. And I'm wondering if uh, these last results give you some hint, uh, local uh, control of the appearance. Uh, certainly in 2D, the singularity cannot maintain long, of course, they are just almost instantaneous. But uh, can you say something about the appearance and disappearance of the singular points? So for the for the one phase, you mean, or for the two phase, or no, for one phase? No, no, you are dealing okay, with okay. one phase, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for the two sure. phase, we can say nothing. Yes. No, 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 no. One phase, one phase, one phase. Okay. For the one phase, appearance and disappearance. So I would say, uh, no. The, the best we can say is that if there is one singular point, then uh, it disappears. Instantaneously, yeah. essentially, right? But 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 we it's not that we are so in 2D for the stationary case, we have much better information because there was the, the results of Sakai, right? That use complex analysis, and you get a complete description of all casts, all singular points. And this is uh Sakai, right? But for the parabolic, you cannot use complex analysis. So uh so we don't know anything else than what I wrote here in the slides. So this is the only thing. We can, I mean, this is the, in terms of size, this is the best one can hope for. But but I cannot, I mean, we cannot prove, I think, a better information about the singular set. So, what kind of result would you have in mind? Like, like a description of I mean, possible... when, uh, you see, uh, when you can, this is one phase problem. So, you have the initial condition, of course, you can have global geometrical constraints, but I mean, locally, uh, the the singularities can arise if the 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 the, the, the surf interface joins, for instance. Yes. Uh, if it disappears, but I'm wondering if you can have uh, appearance of a cusp, for instance. If, if there is the possibility of just uh, controlling the the curvature in such a way that a cusps will arrive. Okay. So I think that it can you can you can have a singular set which is smooth and then just melting it creates a cast for one time this i think it should be possible but um 
because so if you imagine like like a dumbbell right so if you have like a dumbbell with two big pieces then this is like two fronts that are collapsing right so right. but then if you make the dumbbell one part much bigger than the other yes okay so the 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 one that is smaller so this will be like two fronts collapsing two fronts collapsing but at some point uh yeah. yeah at some so if if the dumbbell is too small then there are no cusps at all so there are no two fronts it's just all regular right and if the two dumbbells are similar i mean the two parts are similar the two fronts are collapsing and you get a singular point so there is one critical size mm -hmm. i think there is one critical size for which this starts melting and it creates just a one-sided cusp so a cusp like like this and i think this should be possible i mean i never proved it but i think this can happen it sounds reasonable at least to me uh, that this should be possible but i'm not sure we, we don't prove anything like that okay thank you thank you okay, um, nice. more questions uh, so yeah uh, i have a more simple question uh, am i right that in your main formula uh, the polynomials uh, q plus and q minus uh depend on k which you choose ah that's a good question uh well so yes in the sense that the new terms so the, these polynomials are, are of degree of, of degree k halves right uh, mm -hmm. and then the new terms that are appearing depend on so for 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 every k uh you have to take a larger q because the, the you need higher order expansion so you need higher order terms in this polynomial q but the terms that were already there they are not the same they are they are yeah. so if you take the, the polynomial corresponding to a certain k and the one corresponding to a smaller k then it's just truncating the polynomial and forgetting about the higher order terms. Mm -hmm. okay thank you okay more questions may i also ask one question okay thank you basically you mentioned the probabilistic connections at the start with the stopping times is this something i didn't understand quite clearly linked also to the other analysis that you have okay so you mean this uh this stopping probably... times just at the start yeah 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 this part yeah this is just like the motive a motivation so the same as the the melting of ice, so the same problem arises in this probabilistic game, but we don't use it at all in a sense. We, we don't use uh, any probabilistic tools or any anything related to, to this problem. So this was just another context in which the same equation arises, right? So I don't know um, if this answers your question or- Yes, you... sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, more questions? Then I have some short. Uh, so yeah, uh, how essential in your argument that is, is that exactly Stefan problem? I mean, restrictions for the time derivative. Uh, would oh. your ideas work, for instance, for parabolic uh, free boundary no sign problem? Mm, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's really important that that we have this condition, uh, these two yeah, conditions. I mean, that u is not negative it is very important and also the monotonicity in time it's very important because we have this this uh the contact set the ice is shrinking so we have a monotonicity this is crucial yeah okay thank you okay thank you. so let's send the speaker again